Welcome to Calvary, all of you. Let's all stand together as you're able, and we're going to start with Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down, worship Him now, how great, how awesome it seems, together we sing, everyone sing. We're so grateful that you're here to worship with us this morning. My name is Kristen, and that was our theme, The Earth is Filled with His Glory. Um, Pastor John's sermon title is Believing, Seeing, because believing is seeing. When we believe, we see Christ. And what a praise that the Lord has opened our eyes and our hearts to see and experience His indwelling life in us, and that we can gather today as a group of believers who do see because of what Christ has done to open our eyes. So all of our songs are unto his glory and his holiness and opening our eyes to see him even more clearly as our faith grows and deepens in him. So we'll continue our worship with glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where his cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus, so sweet. took me in glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of life 
Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jordan Clarkson, and we are so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we praise the Lord that we're able to gather here today and welcome each of you, as well as those who are joining us online. I want to direct your attention to the bulletin. As you can see, we have this Get Connected card on the back side. Um, that is attached, and this is a, a chance for you to have some fun. So what we're going to do is have everybody tear this out and off on the count of three. And then we'd love for you guys to fill that out. So on the count of three, we're all gonna go one, two, three. Woo. Hey! So if you are new, we would love for you to fill this out, take some time to write your information in there, your name, your contact information on the card. Uh, you can drop that off in the offering plate when the ushers come by. Um, there is one, um, there's, I guess there's one out in the commons as well. So we can welcome you and thank you for joining us. Um, there's also a spot on the back for any prayer requests that you may have. Um, our team would love to pray for you this week. Uh, there's a place to mark it for the whole prayer team as well as uh, confidential for just the staff and the elders. Sorry, I should have licked my fingers this morning. Um, so the team for the August missions trip is assemble is being assembled and we have 12 students will be raising their own funds for the event if you have any paying projects around the house or yard during the coming month that you'd be willing to have a student to help with please contact pastor rusty or the church office calvary sisters are invited to a practical homemaking meeting this thursday at 6 30 p.m in room two it will be a time to share and discuss ways to save money at home during these economically difficult times. You can come ready and take notes. Feel free to share tips on budgeting, gardening, cooking, energy efficiency, and more. Please contact Linda Bell with any questions. And so at this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward and we will pray for this morning's offering. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for this church, and Lord, we're thankful for um, just this opportunity to come and worship you together. We're thankful for um, each and each person that was able to come today, and for those that are joining us online, and we pray for those that um, couldn't join us today, and we just ask you, you to bless them and, and encourage them in their walk with you. Lord, we're thankful for um, Pastor John and Pastor Rusty, and we just ask that you would continue to lead them and give them your words this morning and um, as, as Pastor John brings us the message, Lord. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this time together. We pray that this offering is, is a blessing unto you and uh, just as a thank you for what you've given us. And 
We thank you for this country. We do pray for the leaders of this country and ask that they would turn to you and, um, Lord, that they would be saved, that they would uh, look to you for guidance, and ultimately that they would uh, just lead our nation in, in a direction that would honor you. And so, Lord, we pray uh, just for the rest of our community. We pray that you would help us to, to continue to just spread your gospel and tell everyone about you and how great of a God you are. And so, Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen.
holy, I want to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see Jesus sent Paul on a mission to his people, the Jews, and the Gentiles, and he told him to open the eyes of the Gentiles that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those sanctified by faith in Christ Jesus.
Father, we do just give you the glory for your holiness and your glory that fills this earth constantly. Lord, it's here, and one day we'll see it even more fully with the new heavens and the new earth, but your glory fills the earth, and we thank you so much for that word. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would just soften every heart in this room and help us to see you more clearly. God, we thank you that you're the giver of faith. Our faith is a gift, and we've received it from you, and we can know the indwelling life of Christ. And so we pray that those of us that already believe, that we would see you more. And Lord, we pray for our loved ones who don't see, that they would be turned from darkness to light and the power of Satan to God, that they too may find a place among those sanctified in Christ Jesus. And Lord, use us. We pray that you'd use our prayers and that we would see you at work as we live with you and watch for you and and are expectant for what you're going to do in our lives and around us. Lord, thank you for Pastor John, and we pray that his word would, your word would, would go forth through his words, and we would hear it and receive it, and we would be changed. Lord, we thank you for the love in this room. We thank you for our brothers and sisters here. Lord, we know some are grieving. We know some may be joyful, and we just ask, Lord, that you would help us to carry one another, carry one another's burdens, and so fulfill your love, Lord, for us. And it's in Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. You may be seated, and children, you may be dismissed for Children's Church if you would like. Our scripture this morning comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You can follow along on the handout. And then Isaiah 6. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. And Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full, is full of his glory. Let's pray. Lord, you are holy, three times holy, exceptionally above all else, Lord, you are on your throne, Father, the creator of all, the one who, in whose mind everything existed and who brought to life everything that has life. Lord, we marvel at you, Lord, from the smallest of things to the largest, Lord, I know we work in our gardens and move some rocks and it takes all day and yet in a moment, in a, in a day, you spoke, Lord, and all the stars came. Lord, the unfath unfathomable weight of glory that you have, Lord, just expressed in the volume of the things that you made and the detail of the things that you made, Lord. I think of the... Um, just the blood in us, Lord, that no man has ever been able to recreate. If, if you need blood, you have to get it from another of your creatures, Lord, that uh, it, it's just not something we can do, Father. It just exceeds us and, and points to your creativity, Lord, and you make it in the bones, even, Father. Who would have thought of that? Lord, in your mind are all these great things, all these wonders, and, and no one's been able to replicate it, Father, it all comes from your great mind, and so you, we say to you, glory, and then not only that, but you say you put eternity in the hearts of men. We can't even see that, Father. We can't work on it. We can't even touch, come close to what you've done, Father. How can, how can a mortal creature put eternity into something? Only you, who's eternal, can put eternity into the heart of man, Lord, and make a soul that no, no man can see and hearts get worked on and bodies and yet only you can see the soul really and work on it father and thank you that you care for our souls enough to shed your holy blood lord to pro give us that promise of eternity lord and to 
help us with that eternal nature, Lord, to give us the assurance of your great love and for us. And we just marvel at you. You're above all and holy, holy, holy. And Lord, this week on our hearts and minds are a few of our dear people, Lord, and we just I just want to take a moment and lift up Pastor John to you as he goes in for a knee surgery on Thursday, Lord. I just pray you'd give him lift, give him, uphold him, help that to go well, Lord. There's um, I lift up our brother Dan to you too, Lord, as he goes in for heart surgery. Lord, we just we just trust that you'll just care for these, Lord, and we just look forward to what you're going to do. And we know that um, no matter what, Lord, we're, all things are upheld by the word of your power. We just get marvel at that, Lord. We just pray for a good week, Lord, and for your glory to be made known to doctors and that beyond the heart, Lord, beyond the knee, Lord, the, the soul would be seen and the magnificent creator behind all things would be exalted. And we just pray for this morning, Lord. We thank you for Pastor John picking this theme for this morning. We pray that it would bless our hearts, Lord. Use him this morning to speak to us, Lord, through your word. And it's your, in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rob. And um, every week uh, for preaching, you want to hear the Lord speak and for direction. And this week, maybe you could take me down just a little bit, Josh. And this week, the Lord spoke to me through Twin City Orthopedic. And they had an opening that came up very quickly. And so we scrambled and the Lord uh, helped and led. And so I'm gonna, if you came prepared for Hosea this morning, keep your anticipation ready to go. So in a few weeks, we'll, uh, when I get back from uh, recovery and things like that. But this was a message as praying with Rusty about uh, where he will jump in uh, next week, the next couple of weeks uh, with a really, really good uh, little series that I think is going to be terrific. And I think hopefully this will set the table a little bit for what Rusty wants to, wants to share. So one of the, one of the obstacles that people that don't know the Lord, one of the obstacles that they face is that they can't, they can't see him. They feel like maybe if I could see the Lord, I, I believe, because we've all been taught, we've seen over the years, that seeing is believing. And so uh, sometimes when it's like, no, it's just, uh, it's, it's seen, uh, dozen, we look through the New Testament, we'll look at some verses here in a minute. Sometimes those that saw the most have the least belief. And, and so sometimes a young kid might go home after a glorious morning of children's church and Sunday school with just uh, illustrations and things like this and might sit in the back seat and cry out to mom and dad and say, but how come I can't see God? <laughs> so it's a little tricky to understand, or maybe a college student that's away from home for the first time and in a perhaps a secular college, maybe not a secular college, and laid on their bed at night uh, with things that they're at that age where they're kind of making things their own and thinking through things and, and wondering if I could just see, I, I could believe better. And maybe, maybe it's all not true. And and if I could just see. And so we see that same thought go through to Thomas, who was one of the 12 who had actually been with Christ, and he wasn't there at the resurrection. And so the other disciples came and said, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. And he said to them, unless I see, unless I see in his hands the marks of nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe <laughs> because seeing is believing. And yet the scripture is so clear to say that no man has ever seen God and Jesus himself said in John 6, not that anyone has ever seen the Father. And so we sing and sing and sing about glory and open the eyes of our heart and all of these great songs, and yet 
if God is intrinsically invisible, how do we see and recognize the Lord and how do we see his glory? And so I want to try to uh, go through this with one answer that has three parts. So how can this work? Since seeing is believing, we think we've been raised this way. We've seen that work in many, many cases. How do we, how do we grow in seeing the Lord? So there's three things. The first one is that the scriptures tell us, and this is what Rob read in Isaiah 6, it tells us like point blank that the whole earth is filled with his glory. Just to reread it again, it's short. This was in the year that King Uzziah had died, and King Uzziah was a, a pretty much a good guy, and Isaiah is losing this king that was in this exalted position, and he died, and, and so God in his kindness and grace and revelatory work gives Isaiah a glimpse into the heavenly realities. What I want to say is that it's not a vision like, well, Isaiah, this is what it might look like. He's opening a spiritual dimension to his eyes, not so that he could say, well, this is what it might look like. He's saying, no, this is what it looks like. <laughs> this is what's happening, even though you don't see it. And, I was, and Isaiah goes on to say, I saw the Lord, and this is Adonai. It's the less common from L-O-R-D, capital letters, which is, is uh, Elohim. This is, this is the kingship. This is the authority, the master, Adonai, the Lord, if you will. And I see him sitting on a throne, which is a position of authority and power. And not only that, but the throne is high, and it's it's lifted up so it's exalted above everything else. And he has this robe on him, and the robe is flowing. If this is hard for us to even imagine, because none of us have ever seen anything that looks like this. But in the spiritual reality, the throne, he sits on the throne. <laughs> we would see this as Jesus, and we see the throne and authority in this robe of majesty and authority and kingship. It flows all the way around the temple, all the way fills every corner and window area, all the way around there, all the way to the back, and the other tail of his throne goes all the way there, and then it fills everything in between. Majesty. It fills this temple, and above the throne are these angelic beings, seraphim, and there's two of them. Each of them has six wings. With two, he covers his face because of the absolute holiness of this vision. With two, he covers his feet because of this holiness, and everything would be unclean if we walked into this. And with two, he suspends himself flying. And one is calling out to the other, back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So it's, like Rob said, this is three times holy. If I said, if you'd been out of town or something, and I said, oh, Saturday, oh man, it, it rained Saturday, you would go away thinking that it had rained on Saturday. But if I said, oh, Saturday, oh, rain, 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 <laughs> you'd understand that it just was like a deluge all day. And this is the meaning when you say it three times, that he's not just like holy one time, doesn't express it enough, so a second time, and then a third time. And the word holy means his, I love R.C. Sproul, this is, I got this from him in his book, The Holiness of God, means otherliness. And so it means that he's not like anything that we know or see, even though we'll talk about the glory story in a minute, but he's just, he's otherly. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, Elohim, of hosts, of armies. And the whole earth is full of his glory. Glory as we know 
here is that which is heavy or weighty about somebody that gives them their importance. And so for the Lord, his glory is everything about him, his, his deeds, his thoughts, his actions, his majesty, his character, his attributes, all of those things, everything he thinks, everything about him is otherly and therefore that which in his being and makeup make him the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That's glory. And he's saying here, the angelic host seraphim are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then they make this statement, the whole earth is full of his glory. So first we could say, well, what parts of the earth are full of his glory? Certainly Western European, you know, Western culture and that. Nope. Whole earth. <laughs> the whole ball, the whole planet. And not only that, we might say, well, I'm sure there's a little glory here. There's some glory here. There's some glory here. And he says, no, no. <laughs> the whole earth is full of his glory. It's packed with his glory. And so this is the first thing as I enter into my dilemma that I, haven't, I can't see the Lord. The first thing that I understand from this is I might not see with my natural eyes, but God is making clear to us that this entire planet that we are on is packed with the glory and the attributes and the actions and the decrees and the authority of the Lord of hosts, who is holy, holy, holy. Romans 1 gives us, spells this out a little bit more for us. It says, for his invisible attributes, so they're not attributes that I can just look at, they're invisible, but these attributes, remember that would be his glory, all of those attributes, Namely, in this case, his eternal power and divine nature, those aspects of his attributes that are invisible, Paul says they have been clearly perceived, and the, the idea with perception there is that they've been seen and understood ever since the creation of the world. How? Where do we see this? We see it in the things that have been made. And so that they are without excuse. Those have rejected God and said there is no God. And if I could see him, I could believe him. He's saying, no, we've done this panorama from the beginning of Genesis 1 until today of the glory of God. And so we see the first step in seeing God is understanding this spiritual presence and working and dimension of the Lord. You can't go anywhere and be away from him. This is, I think, what Psalm 139 was driving. If I go all the way to the, up to the highest heavens, you're there. If I go all the way to the bottom of the ocean, guess what? You're there. If I go to the setting of the sun and the rising of the sun all the way that way, you're there. And so that's what this is saying, that the whole earth is filled with his glory, declaration from God. If this is so, why is it so hard then to see this? The second part of our answer, first is that the whole earth, it is filled with his glory. The second thing that we learn from Scripture then is that sin blinds our eyes. Think of the number of times in the, in the Scriptures, Old and New, uh, especially the New Testament, Old Testament too, when eyesight is used as an illustration for spiritual things. Let me go quickly through these. Jesus, he talked about this often. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? He goes on to say as he rebukes the, the Jews who had seen everything and yet rejected him, he goes on to say, having eyes you do not see, having ears you do not hear, you don't remember. 
And then he goes on and states this, I think, in all four Gospels, but in John 12, 14. This is a troubling verse until you take your time and kind of think it through. It said, he blinded their eyes. This would be Israel who had, who had hardened their heart and refused to believe. It says, he blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn that I would heal them. But if you back up right before this, so here it's saying they, they can't see, but right before this it said they wouldn't see. They would not respond to God. They would not receive his revelation. They would not receive him with with faith, and so God says there comes this point then where if you refuse and won't, then you can't. And I would throw in very quickly that all the way through, and you go to Romans 10, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but in Romans 10, Paul, uh, Paul says about the Lord, where the Lord says, all day long, never ending, I have reached my hands out to a stubborn and obstinate people. So there was grace all the time, every day for those that had a hard heart. And we see throughout the New Testament, many that had hard hearts were softened and drawn into the kingdom. The apostle Paul would be one. We see it in the book of Acts, uh, where this is way at the end of the book of uh, Acts, Acts 28, 27. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, with their eyes they, they have been closed. And so he's talking again here, not that Israel didn't, couldn't see, like couldn't see, but they couldn't see spiritually because they refused faith. They refused what God had shown them. Peter says, they have eyes, this is first, second Peter 2, 14. They have eyes full of adultery. Isn't it just interesting Eyes. We know that sin is that principle, that living principle of sin that abides inside of us totally in the non-believer and as a, as a uh, guerrilla warfare in the believer as it's been unseated. Yet Romans 7 says that principle of sin that Paul still sees inside of him. So we know it's that principle of sin, the sin nature, but he personifies that, if you will, by saying, eyes full of adultery insatiable for sin. It's like you can sin and do a bunch of sin, you're just not satisfied. You got to do more. And that's the picture that Peter is painting for us. John picks this back up again, this eyesight thing. And he says, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. He doesn't know where he's going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And we find out how this happens by Paul, the last one here, how, how, how sin causes blindness is when we follow up Romans 1.20 that we read with 21 to 23, and it said, although they knew God, so they saw this revelation of God. They saw the glory of God and the things that were made. They saw this in creation. Romans 10, he reached out to them continually, day by day, and this was from a passage in the Old Testament was speaking of general revelation. Every day, rising of the sun, setting of the sun, through the night, the stars, during the day, animal kingdom, all these things showing them that there is a God. And yet they didn't honor him. They refused to give thanks. And they became futile as they moved their compass from the one true God, the creator, to man, we'll see in a second here, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Sometimes brilliant, brilliant people with multiple doctorates are just foolish as they reject God. Their heart is dar darkened. Claiming to be wise, they become fools. And here's what they did. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God that we saw in Romans 1.20 and, and, and Isaiah 6.3, where all around us, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. They took that, rejected it, and said, no, instead we'll take that glory that's really his 
and will bring that glory and latch it on to creation and will worship and honor images and mankind himself and animals and things of this nature. They've taken that uh, and, and they've made mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things and, and images of them and they've taken the glory of God and they've assigned it to those things. And it's not until they begin doing this in Romans 1 and, and, and it goes through that tragic, he begins to turn them over to a reprobate heart. And they wouldn't respond and they wouldn't give thanks and they wouldn't recognize him. And so God says, if that's your choice, it's going to get darker for you. And there's always grace and there's always this panorama of glory and always this panorama of grace and yet their hearts get hardened and they get turned over. It's one of the saddest verses in the Bible, and it says it three times. He gave them over to a reprobate mind because they wouldn't. They saw and they wouldn't believe. And so sin blinds us, and even for believers, some of these are not believers, but even for a believer, when I entertain sin in my life and I think that I can really go on with Christ and I can really walk in victory and I can, you know, I can be that joyful, you know, Christian, and yet I want to harbor this or I want to harbor that in my, in my heart, God is saying, you're just fooling yourself because if you harbor that sin and you hang on to that sin... It's like the Holy Spirit begins to pull the shades on this revelation of glory and grace. And you don't stay the same. And you don't go on with Christ. And you don't enjoy the victorious Christian life. Because your heart is hardened. And yet in grace, this wonderful age of grace, at any minute, we can stop and say, oh God, help me in my unbelief. And we can turn back and we can begin to believe. And so we see this uh, greatness of his glory that fills the whole earth. And we see that, that sin has blinded us. So I'm sure you've talked to him. I've talked to sometimes people with great, great educational background and brilliant, brilliant people who really in the grand scheme of life in God's ways are absolute fools. And I don't want to get sidetracked here, but when we have a, a culture where there's a pretty significant chunk of our culture that can't, that doesn't understand what a woman is. And some of the people that say that are brilliant. And they're fools. Because what's seen and understood that's been clear from Revelation, they won't believe it. And they begin to worship these other things. So the third piece of our answer on how do we go forward is that we understand that redemption opens our eyes. So there's many, many things that redemption does. I remember old, old uh, Dr. Chafer when he wrote his book, this was long before I was around, uh, but he wrote his book, he said there was 37 things at least that happen at the moment of salvation that God does for us. You get verses like Ephesians 1 that it just gives you a feel for that. Many, many things that God does. But not the least of which is God opens our eyes. He opens our eyes to salvation. This is a verse that Kristen read earlier, Acts 26, 17 to 18. This was really the quote of Christ's commission to Paul. And so he, he's saying, I'm jumping in the middle here, delivered you, Christ had delivered you from your people and from the Gentiles, so I've delivered you to whom I am sending you to the Gentiles. And here's his mission, verse 18. To open their eyes so that they could turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they might receive forgiveness for sins and a place among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. 
And so salvation, although we, many things are happening in this, one of the things, if you lead somebody to Christ, one of the amazing things, in fact, this would be a time to use the word awesome. <laughs> one of the awesome things is a person looks up from praying and receiving Christ, and spiritually, their eyes are open. What was foolish, stupid, didn't make sense, I got to see it to believe it. And when they surrender their heart and say, okay, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to give in to you and receive that gift of salvation in my heart. Whew. Eyes are open. He says this to his disciples. When they were following him on the better days, when they were walking and following him and understanding him, he says, and he says this a number of times, blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And in Luke 10, he turns to the disciples and privately says to them, blessed are your eyes so that you can see. And he says it to Paul, and I know this was a physical thing here as well, but in Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul is going along. You don't have to remember two years ago we did this in our church here. We went through the book of Acts uh, for a, a year or so. And Paul, you, you could get a really clear picture of Paul where his eyes were uh, prior and he's ravaging the church. He's arresting men and women and kids and throwing them in jail. They're throwing stones and rocks and killing Stephen. And Paul is going, way to go, way to go and full of zeal to put out and crush this movement around the Messiah. And on the road to Damascus, he is stopped up by Christ. And, and part of that chapter, that, that section of Ch Acts chapter 9, uh, Jesus called, caused blindness to happen to him. Now, Paul had been physically sharp with his eyes. Now, his physical eyes don't work. Before, his physical eyes worked, and his spiritual eyes did not work. He's going to crucify again the Son of Man. Blind. The scales come on, uh, on him, so he's physically and spiritually uh, in darkness. And then in verse 18, and it says, And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. I know that there is the physical here. I know that then he could see, but if you just read the chapter, he could see Christ, and he gets up from this place and goes out and immediately is baptized and immediately begins to testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, open eyes. In sanctification, one of the great, great verses uh, on, on this theme, I'm gonna, just going to read this, and this is to the church at Ephesus, and Paul is saying, I'm, you know, I'm praying for all of you ever since I heard about your faith and your love for all the saints. He said, you know, I don't cease ever, I don't stop ever giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, not just the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Father of glory, that revelation of himself in a fallen world, that the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, having, and here it is, the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you might no, here's the results of having the eyes of your heart opened up and enlightened so that you might know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And so even believers need to be prayed for that we continue to have hearts and eyes, eyes of our hearts that are expanded and open more and more so that I can understand more and more. So today, 2022, so who knows who, which of us will be here in 10 years, 
but if we're come back in 10 years, that our hearts would be more knowledgeable and more understanding and embracing and impressed with the revelation of Christ, that we grow in this. And so it's a growing thing. It's something for a non-Christian. They need those eyes opened up. They need for a Christian. We need our eyes reopened when we sin. And even when we walk with him in this progression of sanctification, we need our eyes open. Pray for us, Paul. Elders, pray for us that we would have our eyes opened up and that we would understand and see the glory of Christ. And so we see this. And the, the second thing, I want to just go through some applications of this because it's so important. The g- glory in creation. So he opens our eyes. And so now, let me just start with creation. Where is his glory in creation? It's on the whole earth, and it's full. The whole earth is full. It's everywhere. There are some, here are some illustrations. Psalm 19, 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God in the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. So if we look again, hitchhike on this to uh, Psalm 50 verse 6, it says the heavens are declaring his righteousness. So who hasn't been out on a night when there's no clouds and the, the sky is just inky black, just as black as can possibly be, and then it's dotted with these brilliant little lights that seem like almost like LED lights, except they're a billion times more powerful than an LED light, but they're just brilliant in light. And the darkness goes up to the light, then it's all light, no darkness, all light, and then off to the left or the right, then it's all darkness. And he reminds us in a culture today where we don't have clarity on what's right and what's wrong and and that there is no, everything is relevant and everything, you know, dark and it's kind of gray. Our favorite color, you know, in our culture today is gray where there's no, we just set our own rules and things. And yet if I look at the sky with eyes of faith, knowing who set those stars, and the brilliance of the light and the darkness of the darkness of dark, that I understand then what righteousness is, and God will not be mocked. I look at Psalm 29, 1 to, 1 to 5. I ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe means write down and speak to, to the Lord. O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then he gives this illustration from from either possibly the flood, an illustration from the flood, or a, a gigantic storm coming in from a lake. And it says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. And so we look at this and we see a, a massive storm coming in and just this thundering. Some of you have seen storms like this or been out and see it, especially if you're in a prairie kind of a thing. I remember out in the Dakotas when I, where it's flat, you know, you could stand in Fargo or Watertown where I lived and you could almost see the West Coast. It was so flat for at least for a long, long ways. And sometimes you'd see that sky and you'd see it dark. And right here, it's perfect. It's nice and blue. And it would just get darker and darker. And it's coming and it's coming and coming. And then the winds start to come. And if it's on water, the waters begin to rage and the waves are raging and the thunder crashes and the lightning explodes out of the sky. And the psalmist is saying, that's God. And so if I don't have spiritual eyes, only physical eyes, it's still kind of spectacular. But if I can spiritually translate that and understand that is my God, the creator, flexing his muscles. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars and breaks the cedars of Lebanon. We were a couple of years ago, friends of ours, I have a farm, and we went down the pasture area down right on the north end of of Big Stone Lake, and there's big cottonwoods down there. These things are massive. Five guys couldn't reach around some of them. And we went down there, and they'd had a small tornado that had gone over that area about a month earlier. And there was a cottonwood just laying down. It was just like, boom. And this thing, I don't know, it must have been six, seven, eight feet 
in diameter. And the root ball, my friend went, he's about 6'2", big guy. He went down in the hole and stood there. I have a picture of him. And his top of his head is maybe halfway up this root ball. What kind of power can do that? And so we see this this awesomeness of power that the psalmist is writing about. We jump into the New Testament and we see we, we live by bread. We eat more than bread, but we eat bread. It's the substance of life. It sustains me. And, and so we understand that. We've got to get out of here. And by 1 o'clock, we need to be eating, right? And we know that to, to sustain us. And yet Jesus said, well, you understand that. But understand that I am the bread of life. We know we can only go a few days without water. And then we'll, we'll dehydrate and our organs will dry up and we'll die without water. And Jesus said, yep, you, that's, that's right, that's correct. But I'm the living water. We understand in this last year has been glorious as we've had, I don't know how many new babies. And they're all, every single one, they're just precious, 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 precious. We have another precious one in church with us this morning. And, and they're so precious and so we understand that birth process and that birth and the pregnancy and, and all of that. And yet Jesus said, but you have to be born again. And so he, these physical things point us to greater spiritual truth. Isaiah 43. I could go on forever on this, so you're just free to leave when you have to. I'm sorry, but in Isaiah 43, the scripture says, the beasts of the field glorify me. And so when we see a mother bear who's ferocious in protecting her cubs, it's like that's what God is like in protecting his children. When we see an eagle fly, and they're just so fun, and we're so blessed to have a lot of them out here, and they just kind of soar and soar. And so it's like, are they even trying? (laughs) And they just go and go and go. And God says, that's what you are like when I am empowering you and you're waiting on me and being filled with the Spirit. You'll go and go and go, and you'll not even know how is this happening. And it's a glory story that reminds, reminds us. We've got gorgeous flowers in our garden right now, but there's no mistake in that we know that in a couple of months, they'll all start to die, and they'll wither. In fact, if we don't water them, they'll wither before a couple of months. And they start to wither. And as I look at the flowers and the grasses withering and dying, I'm reminded immediately from that earthy illustration that God said the flowers and the grasses will, will die. But the Word of God abides forever. And so it's a, it's a help to me as I see these other things die, even in all of their glory. I'm reminded that the Word of God goes forever. There's so many more. Paul says in Galatians 4, don't get hung up on the elemental things, these earthly things, and stop there and make philosophies out of the earthly things. Don't do that. Let the earthly things propel you with spiritual eyes to understand spiritual truth. He said to Nicodemus, who should have known, he had all of the Jewish knowledge and understanding, and yet didn't understand about being born again and and expressing faith. And Jesus said, you've seen all of these earthly things. You don't understand the earthly things. How can you understand the the spiritual things? The earthly things point us to the truth and the reality and the glory of God. And there's so many of these. I have to, this is one of my favorite ones. When Israel was going through difficult times, and, and he, God, God writes Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes this in ter- first 39 chapters, our condemnation or judgment that was heavy upon them because of their sin, and 40 to the end of the book is all comfort, and he's comforting his people. And, and, um, and Jacob and Israel had begun to think that their way was hidden from the Lord, How's God know? I can't even see him. And so God says this in grace. Lift up your eyes on high and see. So he's talking about the stars. Who created these? Who brings forth their hosts by number? I've been thinking all week about uh, 
Dan and Audrey and Conrad's, and I've had this verse on my heart all, all week for them as they get ready to go through open heart, open heart surgery. I hope that we have a night on Wednesday night or Tuesday night when you can go out and look at the stars, and then you ask yourself these questions. Who brings them out every night? Who knows them by number and calls them all by name? What are there, trillions of stars? He knows them by name. He does this by the greatness of his might because of his strong power. Not one is missing. And then he goes on to say, Jacob, why do you say and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My, my right is disregarded by my God. And then he goes in to weave these together to know that if God takes care of stars that burn up, and I, I don't know all of the you know, things about all of that, but they're not redeemed people. And if he can take care of the stars and the sparrows, and the little, and the little uh, lilies of the field, will he not take care of you in every step, every second? Surgeons and everything in hospital, who's in charge? The God of hosts is in charge. And he loves you so much that he's going to take care of you and lead you forward. And sometimes we'll, one of us will all, someday we'll have an operation or something that, that doesn't work, and, if, and we die, and if we die, we're ushered by his hand directly into his presence. And Paul said to die is gain. And so creation, as we drive around, ask the Lord to show you his, himself in, in all of the things of nature. Let me do mankind real quick. This would be just general mankind, not believers, but all of man. We see here in Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our own in our image and in our, in our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's dominion. That's a reflection of God who has ultimate dominion. And God created them, man, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And then if we look at Psalm 8, is so helpful. It adds that he crowned him with, with glory and honor. And so we understand that every single human being that we run into in, in life, the ones that we like and the ones that we don't like, the ones that are doing favorable things to us and the ones that are cutting us off in traffic <laughs> without looking, the ones that are, uh, love us and, and care for us and the ones that would sooner run us over and, and those that, that hate us as believers and, and, and hate us as, um, for what we stand for as the people of God. If I understand glory, this, this passage is where we anchor sanctity of life. We honor the unborn because they're made in the image and likeness of God. And I honor the ones, maybe let's just say in the political realm, stretch your imagination a bit, that we can't stand when they come on TV, it's like, oh! And bad thoughts are churned up. But the man or woman of God who understands glory will look and, and know that there is a person, maybe in all-out rebellion, towards God, there is a person with infinite dignity and sanctity because they're made in the image and likeness of God. And this is what some of the biggest, the most effective evangelists uh, that we've ever seen, if you read some of the biographies of the evangelists, they understood this. And so when Francis Schaeffer, who led so many to Christ and through Labrie and all of that, he understood this, this infinite value of the person. And maybe they're half male and half female. Maybe they're, maybe they're way out left or right or whatever it is. Maybe they're all kinds of things. But with eyes to see, he can look and say, there goes an, Im an image bearer. And it is worth my calling to bring Christ to that person. And we're still hearing 
testimonies of people that came to Christ during the 70s and 80s, particularly when Schaefer was doing what he was doing in Labrie. So we understand that, that immense value of other people. So we're careful in how we talk so that I can honor the glory of God. It doesn't mean we're soft on sin. It doesn't mean any of that. It doesn't mean we compromise. But it means when we look them in the eye, we understand that's an image bearer right there. There's a person made, made in the image and likeness of God. Their sin distorts it. Infinite value. Their sanctity of life there. You could go on salvation and the glory of God in salvation. Isaiah 43, he says, Fear not, for I am with you. I, speaking to Israel, now here's Old Testament, Isaiah 43. I will bring your offspring from the east. From the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, don't withhold. I'll bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. So what he's talking about here, we'd understand, is probably during the millennial, a a great regathering and revival of the nation of Israel, bringing them to the land, converted to Christ. And then he says this, everyone who is called by my name, so a believer, whom I created for my glory, that would be all people, whom I formed and made, and that would be all people. So if I go backwards, it's whom I formed and made. I created that person for my glory, and now they're called by my name. So salvation brings that creative work full circle, and it's no wonder that Paul says three different times in Ephesians 1 that our salvation and all the blessings of salvation are to the praise of his glory. Verse 6, they're to the praise of his glory. Verse 12, they are to the praise of his amazing glory. Verse 14, and that Paul would say in Philippians 2, that so that the name of, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall, here it is, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what happens when that occurs? It's to the glory of God the Father. We glorify him when we adore Christ. I need to wrap this up, and I'm thinking of uh, Elisha and his servant, and Syria had snuck in around the city where they were staying, and the servant woke up in the morning and went outside, and he looked, and, and because it had happened at night, as the sun came up, he looked, and the mountains were just full of chariots and enemies <laughs> everywhere he looked. So... What do you do? You run inside and talk to the man of God. (laughs) And you say, behold, an army of horses and chariots is around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what should we do? That would be the question, wouldn't it? (laughs) And Elisha said, don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Well, wait a minute, Elisha. There isn't anybody with us. So Elisha prays. And he said, oh, Lord. Please open his eyes so that he could see. The Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariot all surrounding them. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit there, and I just want to say that I, I trust, and Rusty will kind of pick up on these, these, these themes next week. I want to say we want to be a people that just can, we can see the Lord through the, the glory stories all around us, through the glory of the Word of God. And it's interesting to me that when he says the whole earth is full of his glory, he's saying right before that, holy, holy, holy. The word means uh, th- there's nothing I can pair. It's otherly, totally otherly, and yet the earth is full of his glory. And when I see the Lord and my spiritual eyes have gone from the physical to the spiritual, and I've seen that glory, I step back, and all I can say is, holy, holy, holy. Wow. It's the Lord God Almighty. If this is so, maybe early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. 
Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory can't see, yet only thou art holy and there's none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Let's bow our heads and the worship team can slip up if they'd like. Lord, we want to uh, just, I feel overwhelmed this morning, Father, with this sense of your glory. And I, I'm standing in the midst of ordinary people, but they're ordinary people that are image bearers, and the vast majority of them are also your children. And so, Father, from left to right, there's glory. Glory, 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 glory. And when we sing these great songs of faith together, it's glory. It's a picture, a little foretaste of heaven and of the eternal kingdom. And oh, we long for that, Father. We know the earth is full, the whole earth is full, but we long for the day that there'll be no more sin and death and destruction. Let thy glory come. Lord, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as you are able and we will close. Holy, holy, holy.
Oh, Father, hear our praises. We just adore you. Thank you for verses like that, Romans 10, that said, night after night, day after day, you keep extending your hands to a stubborn and obstinate people. That's like us. Thank you that you're rich in grace. Thank you that you can soften hearts that are really, really hard. Thank you that you have made this great panorama all around us of creation. Father, I just I would, I would just want to pray for Brother Dan and for Audrey and the kids and her family there. I just pray, Lord, that they would just feel your presence and your control and your peace just each day as that day comes up and as they go and as they go under and go through the surgery, Lord, that they would know that they are in your hands. And if you take care of the sparrows, you'll take care of them. And so keep, keep them in perfect peace all through the week. We just love you so much. Give us eyes to see more and more. And we're longing for home, Lord, where it'll be full of glory, except there won't be any of the sin stuff. So we love you and thank you for this morning and our gathering. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day.